Hello friends and welcome to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We are in lesson number eight, Teaching Disciples Part 2. And we are excited that you've joined us. We know that God is going to bless as we study His Word. And as we've been moving through the Gospel of Mark, we have learned that Mark is fast moving. It takes a lot to keep up with Mark, but there's a lot here that we're going to learn that's going to bless us and help us, especially in today's lesson, because we're learning how to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Before we get started in our lesson, let me introduce you to our Sabbath School panel today. My brothers and sisters in Christ, to my immediate left, is John Denzi. Thank you, Pastor James. I have Monday, Jesus and children. Amen. And Danny Shelton. All right. It's good to be here. I have Tuesday, the best investment. Amen. And Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor James. On Wednesday, we look at, can you drink my cup? Mm, and finally, Shelly Quinn. And I have Thursday's lesson, which is another question. What do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. That's a great way to close up the week. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do for you? Because as we learn to be disciples for Christ, of course, the question is going to come up. What does God want us to do individually for Him? Before we get started on our lesson, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And Danny, would you like to have a prayer for us? I would. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings. We thank you for life and health and strength. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Mm -hmm. And Father, we want to be disciples. We want to be used by you. We want to be vessels of honor. So we pray for each and every one, not only here on this platform, but those watching around the world and listening through radio, that through the anointing of your Holy Spirit, we will be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. So we're going to start with Sabbath afternoon. The lessons for this week directs us to a number of Bible verses. Mark chapter 10 is going to be the main focus, but we're also directed to Genesis 1.27. I'll be looking at that in relationship to marriage. Genesis 2.24 also. And then Galatians 4, 1 and 2, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, and Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, which are some of my favorite scriptures in Isaiah 11. is a powerful chapter. Our memory text today is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And let's just read that together. Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. What a beautiful picture of Jesus we have there. So this week covers Mark chapter 10, and it's completing the special section in which Jesus is teaching his disciples in preparation for the cross. So the half of the chapter deals with the disciples themselves, and the rest actually deals with issues that are important to discipleship, but told through the lens of others who interact with Jesus. The Pharisees, for example, come and they argue with him over the subject of marriage and divorce. Parents bring their children to Jesus to be blessed. And then we have this man, this rich man, who asks about eternal life, and a blind man who asks for sight. Mm. This chapter of Mark carries important mm. teachings about what it means to follow Jesus, particularly as it relates to living in the here and now. Marriage, children, how to relate to riches, and the reward of the lost, excuse me, and the reward and cost of following him. So topping it all off is the healing of this second blind man. In a previous study, we talked about the healing of the first blind man. Now we're going to be looking at the healing of a second blind man, which is going to provide for us this closing bookend to this section. This section that uh, starts with the healing of a blind man and is ending with the healing of a blind man. And it gives a beautiful illustration of what following Jesus both costs and what it leads to. The restoration, not just of our physical sight, but of our spiritual sight. So together, these lessons prepare the follower of Jesus, whether the disciples were 2,000 years ago or disciples in the 21st century, for the challenges that come with discipleship. So let's move to Sunday's lesson. It's entitled, God's Plan for Marriage, and it directs us to chapter 10 of Mark, verses 1 through 12. And I'm going to read that whole section as one, and then we'll comment, we'll talk about it. The other references are in Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24, where marriage is described as an, a, an original ordinance of God, for the very creation of this world. So Mark chapter 10, let's start with verse 1. And he arose from thence, Jesus, and coming into the coasts of Judea by the further side of Jordan, the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. Verse 2, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? 
And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of God's creation he made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore, verse 9, God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Now, this version is a little bit different from a similar discourse that we find with Christ and his disciples and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19. I'm not going to read the Matthew 19 version, but I want to give you the references. It's Matthew 19 verses 3 all the way through to verse 12. And what you're going to see in the differences, I'm just going to outline that for you, is that when the Pharisees come in Matthew's uh, discourse, when they interact with Jesus there, they ask if it's okay to be divorced from your wife for every cause. They also, uh, Jesus also responds by saying that no, you can't divorce except for fornication, which isn't in this particular discourse here in Mark chapter 10. And then the disciples respond to the Matthew 19 discourse, and it's really interesting what they say when Jesus says, you know, you shouldn't get divorced except for fornication. They say, well, then, men shouldn't get married. <laughs> so you can see in this context that they've been living under this shadow of Phariseeism in a sense. That, you know, you can get married, but if you've got a good reason to get divorced, you know, Moses says you can write a bill of divorcement. Just go ahead and get divorced. And when Jesus kind of clarifies, no, actually God made man and female to be one and not to, to, to be divorced and separated. Uh, when Jesus brings us back to the beginning, to the foundation of creation and the purpose for marriage, the disciples kind of freak out. Whoa, then it's, it's good not for anyone to get married. Well, then Jesus clarifies, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, actually, there are people that can't really handle that. Being single is not God's plan. When we go back to Genesis, we found that it was not good for man to be alone. And that's what we see in the context of creation. Man created every animal, every living thing to be paired up with another. And when Adam saw all of that, and of course he didn't have a wife yet, there was no Eve when Adam saw all of that, he felt lonely. And of course God helped him in feeling his need. God helped him to more appreciate what he was about to do when he put him to sleep and he operated upon him. The first anesthesia, the first operation, took a rib from his side and created out of that rib Eve, woman. And of course when Eve came to, to Adam, he was just overwhelmed with with joy and happiness and he had he was complete now and this was the reflection of the image of God male and female created he them in his image and so Jesus says wait a minute wait a minute it's not good for men to be alone now there 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 are three types of men that are single basically he says the first type are single by birth there are some men that are born by birth to be eunuchs they aren't able to marry for this, based on the case of their birth, for some reason, uh, that can happen. Then there are other men who are made eunuchs by other men. I think of Daniel, right? Isaiah predicted that the Babylonians would come and they would make eunuchs out of your princes and take them captive. And so Daniel was under the prince of the eunuchs. He was made a eunuch uh, by the Babylonians. And then there are those, Jesus says, who are made eunuchs who make themselves eunuchs, I should say, for the kingdom of God. And I think about that with Paul. I'm, I'm assuming that Paul kind of said, you know, I'm not going to get married. Uh, some suggest as a Pharisee that he was married at one time and maybe he lost his wife. We don't know that because he became a Christian, but we do know that he remained single for the, his entire Christian ministry. And he didn't do that because he was against marriage. When I first started studying the Bible, I thought, oh, Paul, I'm going to be like Paul. He wasn't for marriage. No, Paul said marriage is honorable in the bed and defiled. Uh, Paul talked about the importance and significance of marriage in relationship to uh, ex it reflecting uh, the relationship with God and his church in Ephesians chapter 5. So Paul wasn't against marriage, uh, but he remained single and he did so presumably for the kingdom of God's sake. So 
when we look at this, we need to recognize what's taking place in this interaction with the Pharisees. Hiding behind this question they're asking Jesus is a plot to get Jesus in trouble with Herod Antipas, the ruler of that region east of the Jordan where Jesus now was. Antipas had divorced his wife and married Herodias, his brother's wife. Herod had beheaded John the Baptist because of his rebuke regarding this illicit relationship. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 14, 1 through 12. So Jesus kind of parries their question with his own, asking the Pharisees, well, what did Moses command on the, on the matter? And the, pa the passage that the Pharisees, or that Jesus refers to, uh, the Pharisees use to try to say, well, Moses says we can just divorce anytime we want to, we can write a divorce. But if you look at it in its context, it's found in Deuteronomy 24, one through four, it really is there to protect a woman who might be divorced by her husband, to give her an opportunity to remarry and to reestablish herself in society. So the Pharisees have kind of used this in a way to put the woman down, to uh, disparage the woman, to put her out of society when really it was there to protect the woman. And Jesus is trying to get back to Genesis and bring that stature, that position of the woman back into prominence as one with the man and not disparage her and, and have her cast aside by this misrepresentation of Moses' writings. But here's the thing. We have a lot of divorce today. We have a lot of troubles in marriage. We have a lot of difficulties that are taking place between men and women in our world today. And we wanna ask the question, what can we do to strengthen marriages? What can congregations do to strengthen marriages? How can we help marriages that have already fallen apart? And so here are a few takeaways or a few suggestions, a few suggestions for what we can do. First of all, pre-marriage counseling is so important. You know, we prepare ourselves for school, we prepare ourselves for our careers, we prepare ourselves for almost everything we do, but do we really prepare for marriage? And I can't tell you how many young couples have actually uh, uh, contacted me over the years and said, do you do pre-marriage counseling? Counseling? We're already married, but we didn't do any premarriage counseling. Yes, we can go over some premarriage counseling with you. Another thing that really is helpful and something that helped uh, my wife and I is marriage seminars. You can learn a lot from other people who've done the research, who've been married for a while, who really have some experience and wisdom. So have a marriage seminar at your church. We're having a marriage seminar at our church. Actually, my wife and I are leading out on this marriage seminar in our church here in a couple of months. And then marriage counseling. Marriage counseling is so important. My wife and I were in marriage counseling the first year of our marriage. And then again, after seven years, I think we've been marriage counseling at least four times in the 35 years uh, that we're working on, 35 years that we've been married. And then finally, you know, follow gospel order and church discipline for non-biblical divorce as well as for fornication, illicit sex. Follow gospel order. Let the church deal with some of the problems that are going through this in a very careful way. And remember forgiveness. Remember rebaptism for truly repentant persons. And then, of course, maintain a very high standard in your church. Don't compromise the standard of the Bible to accommodate uh, divorce, but rather reach out to those people who are going through difficult times because a lot of people fall and we want want to pick people up, not trample over them. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I now turn to Monday's portion of the lesson, and it's entitled Jesus and Children. And the lesson tells us, read Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, and it says, What did Jesus do for those who brought children to them? So let's go to Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. The disciples were trying to protect Jesus. Oh, Jesus is very busy. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing people. He doesn't have time for children. No, no, take the children away. No, no, you cannot see Jesus. But Jesus heard it and rebuked them. I read to you from Desire of Ages 5.11. Notice, among the Jews, it was customary for children to be brought to some rabbi that he might lay hands upon them in blessing. But the, Sav the Savior's disciples thought his work too important to be interrupted in this way. When the mothers came to him with their little children, the disciples looked on them with disfavor. They thought these children too young to be benefited by a visit to Jesus and concluded that he would be displeased at their presence but it was the disciples with whom he was displeased. The Savior understood 
the care and burden of the mothers who were seeking to train their children according to the Word of God. He had heard their prayers, and he himself had drawn them into his presence. So we see here a beautiful picture of Jesus paying attention to little children, and as he paid attention to little children then, he pays attention to little children today. And so I encourage you mothers to and fathers to bring your children to Jesus. Mark 10, 15 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Mm -hmm. What a picture we see here of Jesus mm -hmm. taking time to take children into his arms, putting his hands on them, blessing them, and of course, that brought great encouragement to the mothers. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Savior takes time for each and every one of us. And I just praise the Lord, you know, sometimes you call people and uh, they don't answer. Sometimes you call people, you have to leave a message. Uh, some people, you, I'm gonna give my wife an example on this one. <laughs> sometimes uh, she calls me and says something to me and I, uh, she says, okay, I'll see you later. And then I say, oh, I forgot to tell her this. I call her and, She's gone. <laughs> she, she won't answer the phone. She's on another call. And some people are very busy that way, but God is always available Amen. to each and every one of us. I read to you from Signs of the Times, April 9, 1896, how appropriate it was that these children should be brought to Christ for His intercession and blessing. They were types of what the members of His church should become. The children of God are to possess the humility, the loving trust, the teachable spirit, the innocence, mm. uncorrupted by worldly deception that were possessed by the little children. So we see here why Jesus said that of such is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because these children are, uh, they have humility, mm. loving trust. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, I saw that in our children. They, they trusted everything we said, you know, as when they were little children, eventually they grow up and they start to question what you say. But when they are little, they are humble. They believe you know all things. You, and mom and dad know everything, you know, and they think you're the greatest thing. Oh, my dad is stronger than your dad. You know, they, 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 they protect uh, their parents. They, they love their parents. And the way they love their parents is the way that we should love God with all of our hearts and trust in God implicitly. Uh, not like uh, this, I heard this story. I read this story actually, and I said, that's a terrible story. And this man said to his child, come. And the child was up elevated somewhere. Come, come, son, come, son, jump, jump, I'll catch you. And the, when the child jumped, he moved aside, the child fell, and he said, that should teach you not to trust anybody. Mm -hmm. That's a bad lesson. Mm -hmm. We need to teach our children mm -hmm. the right things. And, and that's why I wanted to bring out that we need to be example for children in these days that we live in. And uh, uh, the lesson brings this out. Uh, actually from the book, Ministry of Healing. Uh, it brings this out, it's very important as well. Let not your unchrist character mist represent Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do not keep the little ones away from him by your coldness and harshness. Mm -hmm. Now, did you catch that? The way we behave can keep children away from the Lord. Why? Because we're cold and harsh. Mm -hmm. It says, never give them cause to feel that heaven would not be a pleasant place to them if you were there. Mm. Do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand or act as if they were not expected to accept Christ in their childhood. Do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom and that in coming to the Savior, they must give up all that makes life joyful. Mm. Uh, the Ministry of Healing, page 43. You know, sometimes children hear discouraging things from children, um, from people. Uh, I remember being in a church. I'm not going to say where it was. It wasn't Thompsonville, by the way. <laughs> and I heard somebody up there say, you know, being a Christian is hard. And this person was on the platform. You know, being, and everybody heard this. And I go, what in the world? This is bad. Being a Christian is hard. And I go, what in the, and I said, there's something wrong with the experience of this person with Jesus, because to be a Christian, should be a delight. Amen. And it says in Amen. Psalm 16 that in the presence of the Lord is pleasure evermore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we need to let children hear what it says in Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. Children need to hear that. Mm -hmm. 
that to live a wicked life, there is no peace for you, no happiness without Jesus. How about Proverbs 13, 15? Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressor is hard. The way of transgressor is hard. Being a Christian should not be hard. It should be a joy knowing that you're walking with Jesus. And concerning what people say that uh, being a Christian is hard, let's take, at the wor let's take a look at the words of Jesus mm -hmm. there in Matthew 11. Jesus says, uh, yeah, let's just read, well, start in verse 28. Mm -hmm. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, gentle and lowly of heart. King James says, meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We find rest in Jesus. Now notice verse 30, for my yoke is easy. easy and my burden is light. It doesn't say that my yoke is hard. Oh, take my yoke, you're going to suffer. You're going to be suffering a hard life. No, Jesus says, my yoke is easy mm -hmm. and my burden is light. Let the children hear that instead of being a Christian is hard. What about, you know, these sad, gloomy expressions. I know that sometimes we're going through difficult times and we have to be in prayer and you may not have a smile on your face all the time, but don't let that be the constant experience of your life that you always have a sad look, like being a Christian is one of the most horrible things in the world. I remember that in the church as I was growing up in Chicago, there was a, a deacon that they gave him the nickname, the sad deacon, <laughs> the sad deacon. And it's because he had this face like he was always sad. I don't know why, but uh, for some reason that's stuck in my mind. We need to give children the understanding that it is a pleasant mm -hmm. to be a Christian. It is a happy experience to be uh, a Christian. It is a joyful experience to be a Christian. Remember that it says in Matthew chapter 5, let your light so shine before men and before children that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Today, in these times that we live in, children need to see a Christian. I hope they see a Christian in you and in me. Uh, so they need to see that it's a good thing to be a Christian. Uh, yes, times are difficult, but we have the Lord with us. Mm -hmm. And let them hear the wonderful experiences of Pray, prayers that are answered, mm -hmm. and how, uh, how was your week? Oh, it was the worst week of my life. Let them hear good things. Let them hear that Jesus is a, a, an ever-present Savior that is always there for us. And as they see uh, you living as Jesus would live, it should be an encouragement and also inviting for them to mm -hmm. be a Christian. Notice here in the lesson that, uh, oh, I, I, it says, uh, let not your unchrist character, I read that already, never give them a cause to feel that heaven would not be a pleasant place uh, to them if you were there. Mm -hmm. So take a look at your experience. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the way you are behaving, especially among children, because their minds uh, are here, uh, they're always uh, capturing, capturing information and their minds are being molded by what they see and hear. Let them hear that you love Jesus and it is a joy to be a Christian. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Johnny. That was fantastic. It is not a sad or hard experience. Jesus Christ's yoke is easy, his burden is light. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello, friends. Glad you're still with us. We're turning it over to Danny Shelton. You ready, Danny? I am. All right. The best investment. Uh, we're going to be looking at Mark 10, 17 through 31. Now, we may not get through all of it, but we're going to start reading, and uh, then we'll summarize. Why don't you join me now? And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I've observed from my youth. I'm sure he's feeling pretty good by now. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus beholding him loved him. We'll come back to that. And he said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, mm -hmm. and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, mm -hmm. for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto him, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Mm -hmm. So look, if we stopped right here, that's the answer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now the first thing that struck me in reading these texts was verse 18. When the man asked Jesus what he must do to be saved... Jesus' answer wasn't, I'm the way, the truth, the life, whatever you might expect he would say. He just said, thou knowest the commandments. Then he referred him to the last six commandments or man's duty to man. Then the rich man said, I've done all these things since my youth. But now here's the problem. And Jesus knew it when he asked the question. Like so many others of us, this man failed to keep the very first commandment of thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is something that I struggle with, and I'm sure that you do too. But remember, it's impossible with us, but not with God. His earthly possessions came first. No matter how morally good a person appears to be, moral sainthood is not the key to heaven. Our personal relationship with Jesus Christ is our key to heaven. Now, the first four commandments are the vertical commandments. They're the ones pointing up to Jesus. They unlock the door to understanding Get this, they unlock the door to understanding who God is and who we are. That's amazing. If we can just get that straight, it's going to help us tremendously in this walk. If we really understand who God is, the creator of the universe, right? And who we are. He's our creator, our savior, our king. This revelation should humble us to fall prostrate, literally on the ground before God in sorrow and repentance for our sins which the Lord gladly forgives, by the way. I can refer you to 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, what will he do? He's faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I ask myself here, how do I stand? And maybe you want to ask yourself, how do you stand today uh, as a Christian when it comes to keeping all of God's commandments? Are we different than the rich man? If we had a one-on-one -on -one in person with Jesus, would we turn and walk sorrowfully away? I would hope not. As SDAs, we certainly have a great understanding of the Bible and we preach the keeping of all 10 of the commandments. But unlike the rich man, are we willing to sacrifice everything for God? We may specialize in the fourth commandment, which is very important to keep. But some of us allow culture and politics to blind our eyes to some of the other commandments. I don't have time to get into that but some of you know what I'm talking about. Many of us are no different than the rich man. Perhaps we can say that we have kept the commandments from our very youth, from as long as we can remember, but in actuality, we may still have other gods with the little g's before him. Next, I was struck with verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him loved him. Wow. This in itself is not surprising as the Bible says, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn thee. That's in Jeremiah 31, 3. So, but I think some of the times in our humanness, we forget how personal love is to Jesus. I think Jesus feels compassion and love for this man as he knows in advance that he's not truly willing to give up everything. 
Jesus knew this when he began to talk to him, when he asked him the question. So basically, Mark says that Jesus loved him, and it reminds us that Jesus loves each, each and every one of us, but when we, we reject his love, it, it must hurt him deeply. Yes, Jesus would have given his life to save only one person. And here we see Jesus conversing one-on-one -on -one with this man. So now I'm guessing that this man, I, this is a thus said Danny, I'm guessing that he was not a happy guy. And uh, because sometimes too much money and possessions and responsibility can rob us of our joy. You talked about it earlier, we should be joyful. Well, I can imagine that when he saw Jesus and the disciples saw the peace, saw the fun that they were having, he must have knew instantly that something was wrong with his spiritual life. So that's why he turned to Jesus, that's my opinion, went to him and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Like, I want to be like this. I want to find this peace. Well, we know that Jesus loved him like no other person could. The Savior wanted to spend eternity with him. Yet this man, having met the master of masters, now this could be us, I hope not, and we pray not, the creator of the universe, this man still chose death over life. Isn't that sad? This man may not have even realized that he was in a lost state spiritually, but now face to face with the truth giver, he didn't argue with him, he didn't defend his position, he just turned and walked sadly away. Wow. I want to go right now to verses 23. We're kind of overviewing 23 to 25. My time's running out on me. Jesus seems to center in on how hard it is for a rich man to enter to heaven. In fact, he likes, likens it to a camel going through a needle. The eye of a needle was indeed a narrow gateway into Jerusalem. It wasn't a little needle and thread, that type of thing. But since the camels were heavily loaded with goods and riders, they would need to be unloaded in order to pass through the small uh, gate. Therefore, the analogy is that a rich man in a similar fashion would have to unload his material possessions in order to be able to get through this gate. Well, maybe from a spiritual standpoint uh, view, it simply means that we as Christians are going to have to get rid of a lot of baggage, right? If we want to get ready for heaven and go through heaven's gate, I think we're going to have to look at that seriously. While the Bible points out here that the rich man's possessions were his downfall, there are many other obstacles besides the riches besides the riches that we can place before our Creator God. Most of us here and those watching at home are feeling pretty good by now saying, well, look, I'm not rich. This really doesn't affect me. I don't know about my, you know, friends up here, brothers and sisters, but most of us <laughs> are, are with me. Okay. <laughs> so, but I want to tell you that riches can be a great gift. There's nothing wrong with riches. It's how we use them. I know a number of wealthy people that God blesses because they use their riches to evangelize to the world, to the lost and dying world. God gives his people many gifts. Sadly, many Christian people who are gifted in other areas of life, such as great musical abilities or great athleticism or who are considered extremely smart by their peers, often choose to compromise the world, negating the first commandment. There are many of us who are so focused on our jobs and our businesses that our long-term goals have somehow failed to include Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow. We too have compromised with the world, therefore negating the first commandment of thou shall have no other gods before me. So in the same vein, we can use the example of the camel through the small gateway to the cities. Are we willing to unload pride, mm -hmm. vanity, want of worldly fame, Selfish desires to serve the Lord. Have we, have we even placed some of our family members before God? Sadly, sometimes we do. Well, moving on quickly, verses 26 and 7, Jesus answers the disciples, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Jesus is telling us that we can do nothing as frail human agents to save ourselves. <laughs> We can only be saved when we submit and commit our lives to him and ask him to forgive us of our sins and then turn from our wicked ways. And when we do, our love for Jesus will so, be so strong that the world around us, Jesus will shine out. And he says, I, if I be lifted up from this earth, will draw all men unto me. 
Amen. Thank you so much, Danny and Pastor Johnny and Pastor James. What an incredible lesson God created marriage. Being a Christian is a joy and make a choice for Jesus and choose life. That's powerful. My name is Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, I do have Wednesday, don't I? We look at, mm -hmm. can you drink my cup? We're still in Mark chapter 10. We're going to read verses 33 through 45. Mark 10, we're going to pick it up in verse 33. Now, as we had talked in Teaching Disciples Part 1, which is last week's lesson, remember the first eight chapters of the book of Mark is all about who is Jesus. And we come to Peter's declaration, you are the Christ. Then the last chapters of the book of Mark from chapters 9 to 16 is all about where is he going? He's going to the cross. And the Jews did not understand that. They're looking for a Messiah who would deliver them from the Romans. So in my section here, we're, remember there was the blind man that Jesus healed in this whole section that we're talking about. Then there were three predictions where Jesus said, I'm going to the cross. And they said, no, you're not. I'm going to the cross. No, you're not. I'm going to the cross. And then he gives these teachings on discipleship. And the last book end, it ends with the healing of the blind man Bartimaeus, which Shelley will have tomorrow on the next day. So as we look at this, this is Jesus' third prediction. I'm going to the cross. We're in Mark 10, verse 33. Behold, now Jesus and his disciples are going up to Jerusalem. And if you look at the next chapter, Mark chapter 11, you'll discover that this is the triumphal entry. So we're almost to the very last days of Jesus' life. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now, let me ask you all, is that clear? Yes. It's, that's pretty clear, isn't it? But you can't be any more clear than saying, I'm going to be spit on and I'm going to be mm. killed. Mm. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Mm. And yet the disciples did not understand. Mm. You see the same passage in the book of Luke, Luke 18. The word of God says they understood none of these things. Jesus said it and they didn't understand. Mm. Takeaway number one, truth is hard to understand when your heart is unprepared okay. to receive it, mm -hmm. when truth isn't what you want to hear, when truth mm -hmm. cuts against the natural heart, when truth goes against what you've been taught or the tradition you always held to, mm -hmm. it becomes easy to dismiss truth. It's easy to rationalize it away, to ignore it, or to pretend it doesn't exist. So the disciples, instead of internalizing what Jesus wanted to tell them, so they'd be spared that suffering and agony when he was crucified, what happens? James and John come with a request. The next verse, uh, verse 35. And then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Mm -hmm. What are they saying? Will you do us a favor? We have a favor right now. We have a request of you. And what does Jesus say? Verse 36, he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Takeaway number two, love invites us to articulate our desires. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew what they wanted. He could read their hearts. He didn't even have to say that. And yet he said, what's your request? What do you want me to do for you? It reminds me when I, Danny, I was your secretary. And I remember coming into you and saying, we have this situation and this is something going on. And you would say, what do you think we should do? I'll never forget that. What do you think we should do? That's freedom of expression encouragement to think for yourself. So Jesus says to his disciples, what do you want me to do for you? Love invites us to articulate our desires. And what did they say in verse 37? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on the right hand and one on the left in your glory. Now, Jesus had just said he's going to the cross. And what do they say? Grant that we could sit one on the right hand and one on the left. Takeaway number three, self appears even in ministry. Mm -hmm. So James and John, were they not disciples? 
Were they not committed to God? Had they not left, Shelley, had they not left fishing for God? They had left their uh, profession for God. They have left, left their work to follow Jesus. For three and a half years, they've been following Jesus and they still had self interwoven in the very fabric of their being. They wanted the highest place in the kingdom. You and I can think we're serving God with altruistic motives. Oh, I'm working for the betterment of humanity. I want to help others. And we might not even recognize that we have self interwoven even in ministry. The next verse, verse 38. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you ask because they wanted the, the best position in his kingdom. And he said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? What is that cup? The last supper and then in Gethsemane. Remember Jesus saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus saying, can you drink the cup of suffering? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm to be baptized with? Are you willing to even die? for me. Can you be baptized? What I love about this is Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He seeks instead to deepen and purify their love. Take away number four. Love seeks the betterment of others. He could have chastised them. He could have scolded them. You've been following me three and a half years and yet you still don't understand. You still have self interwoven. So instead of that, Desire of Ages, page 548 says, he doesn't rebuke, but he seeks to deepen and purify their love. Love seeks the betterment of others. So he said, can you do this? Are you sure you can do this? Are you sure you can bear the suffering that I'm going to bear? What do they say in verse 39? We are able. <laughs> we got this. We're able. Take away five. Self is blind. Self is blind. You ever recognize that it's hard to see yourself? It's hard to see your own pride. It's hard to see your own selfishness. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see many times I can think of myself more highly than I ought. Mm. Self can be blind. Next verse, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized, you will be baptized. Remember, James was the first apostle to be killed. That would be the mid AD 40. So 10 years, over 10 years after Jesus was crucified, James was beheaded with a sword. Now, John lived a long, full life. Mm -hmm. However, he was tortured. He endured reproach. He endured criticism and persecution. They were baptized with a baptism that Jesus experienced and they took of that cup of suffering. Then Jesus says, but to sit on my right hand and on my left, it's not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it is prepared. You see, position is not bestowed arbitrarily. It is not gained through favoritism. It is not earned. Take away six. Position is the result of character. Mm. Let's read the next verse, verse 41. When the 10 heard it, the other disciples, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. They are thinking they're getting a high place in the kingdom. Now they're jealous. Take away seven. Self is always jealous. Mm. Mm. The easiest way for you and me to tell if we have self inside is when we're jealous of other people. Mm. Why'd they get that position? Why did they get that over here? I don't, well, how did they earn that? When you discover jealousy in your heart, you know that self is still alive. Mm -hmm. The next verse, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know, those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, they lord it over them and the great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. You see, the Gentile rulers used power for personal advantage. The higher classes were to uh, think and decide and rule. The lower classes were to serve and obey. In God's kingdom, Kingdom. Power is to be used to uplift and bless other people. Mm -hmm. It is not to be used to trample. It is not to be used to put other people down. Take away eight. Love seeks to lift up other people. Our last verse, verse 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus, 
He ransomed us. He bought us back from the slavery of sin. The cost of breaking my bondage and yours was the life of Jesus. Mm. Our final takeaway, number nine, the heart of true greatness is not just service, but sacrifice. Mm. If you want to be in a leader in any sphere of influence, even in the home, no, it's not just even service, it requires sacrifice. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Glory to God. Thank you for that lesson, Jill and John, James and Johnny and Danny. It's good. I'm Shelley Quinn. I'm Thursday's lesson. This is Jesus' question to a blind man. What do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. So there are two miracles that serve as bookends for Mark's section here on discipleship. The first miracle is a blind man. Jesus has to touch him twice to restore his sight. Mm -hmm. And that just illustrates that sometimes it takes a little while for spiritual insight to take hold. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to read in Mark 10 where Jesus has no physical touch. It is merely a declaration of healing. Mm -hmm. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because this blind man already had spiritual eyes that are wide open. Let's look. Mark 10 and verse 46 is where we'll begin. Mark 10, 46. Now they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, these would be throngs of people that are on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. So there was a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, okay, he, he's already heard about him, obviously. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So here Jesus and his disciples are walking out the city gates where the blind would sit and they were hoping that mm -hmm. someone who passed by would take pity on them. Bartimaeus was physically blind, but he had the spiritual eyes to recognize mm -hmm. Jesus mm -hmm. and his divine ancestry, that he was the Davidic Messiah. And so he is sitting there. Son of David was a messianic title. As a matter of fact, let me read from the uh, study guide. Quote, the title Son of David in Jesus' day had two concepts connected with it. First, the restoration of a king to Israel's throne. And second, that this personage would be a healer, mm -hmm. an exorcist, mm -hmm. unquote. So when Bartimaeus cried out, this is a confession of faith. Mm -hmm. He is crying out, with confidence that Jesus Christ had the ability to heal him. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question. How do we react mm -hmm. in the presence of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Are we reacting with faith and confidence? Mm -hmm. So now, Mark 10, 48. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, as we have looked through Mark, we know that there is this revelation secrecy motif. Mm -hmm. And so far, up to this point, Jesus has been the one who's been saying, okay, don't tell anyone what I've done. Don't, you know, be quiet about this because he's waiting for his time to be fulfilled. He's wanting to finish his ministry. But now it's interesting because now the crowd takes over this secrecy motif and they're trying to hush up <laughs> Bartimaeus. Mm -hmm. And they continue to try to hush him up. They're annoyed at his persistence. Another question, how do we react to the presence of faith in others? Mm -hmm. Bartimaeus, his cry was a childlike faith. He was depending on God's mercy and grace. And 
He wasn't dissuaded when the crowds tried to hush him. He cried all the louder. You know, the blind were totally dependent on charity and the guidance and protection of others. And in the ancient world, this is sad but true, the blind were one of society's disposables. Mm. It's sad. They were expendable. That's how the crowd looked at Bartimaeus. But guess what? No one is insignificant to Jesus. Yeah. So the crowd is wrong. Mark 10, 49, Jesus stood still and he commanded him to be called. This is interesting. You're going to find called three times in this passage. Jesus stood still. He commanded Bartimaeus to be called. Then they called the blind. Jesus has commanded it. Then the people call the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. So Jesus perceives not only Bartimaeus' need, but his faith. And he reacts differently than the crowd does. Don't you love that? He commands the man to be called to his sight. This is what's interesting to me. He's on his way to Jerusalem. The shadow of the cross is looming across his path. Yet, Jesus always had time to minister to people who were in despair. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. I think that Jesus is setting an example here for us because in the middle of his mission, his, his Jerusalem mission to fulfill going to the cross and dying for us. Mm -hmm. He takes time to bring this man blessings and peace. So let me ask another question. On our journey, our faith journey, I know how busy we all get. Do we always pause and take time out of mm -hmm. our schedule mm -hmm to meet the desperate cries of others. Mark 10, 50, throwing aside his garment. This is Bartimaeus' reaction. Whoa, Jesus is calling me. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. When Jesus calls him, he doesn't delay. Mm -hmm. Bartimaeus leaps up. He leaves everything he had, including his cloak. To the blind, the cloak was everything. This was his covering. This is what they used for begging. This was his security. This was his home. When he left that cloak behind, that means I'm leaving it. It's kind of like, come and I'll call you to be fishermen. And they walked away from their boats. Well, now he's calling Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus, it says, I've got faith. You're going to heal me. I'm leaving my old life behind. I love that. This is as significant as when Jesus walked by the tax booth and told Matthew, come on, and Matthew leaves everything behind. It's a beautiful story. So Mark 10, verse 51, Jesus answers and says to him, here the man comes running up. And now Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What? Why would he say that? The man is crying out, have mercy on me, I'm blind. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. This is the same question that he asked James and John. What do you want me to do for you? Now Bartimaeus doesn't ask for a seat in glory. He asked for something so life-changing and so practical. He wants Jesus to heal him. Why did Jesus ask? Why does Jesus say, what do you want me to do for you? I think first he's helping us identify our motives, helping us identify our need, but he's also, it's kind of a recognition of our faith in his ability. So without a hesitation, Bartimaeus says, restore my eyesight in the physical realm. 
he already had eyesight in the spiritual realm. Okay, Mark 10, 52, Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. I love this quote from the study guide. Quote, Jesus does not disappoint. Indeed, whoever comes to him for help in the gospels always receives it, end quote. So Bartimaeus trusted Jesus. He followed Jesus toward the cross. Now, don't misunderstand. It was God who healed Bartimaeus, but it was his faith that was the channel mm -hmm. through which those healing streams of power could flow. And this is just the most beautiful book end of these two miracles. And I think what it illustrates is discipleship requires spiritual eyesight. Amen. Amen. Great lesson. Amen. We've got just a couple minutes left for a few more comments. We're going to start with Jan Denzi. Yes, I share from Desire of Ages, page 512. He who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, still invites mothers to lead up their little ones to be blessed by him. Even the babes in his mother's arms may dwell as under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. Amen. For me, I, I think from the study that I did here, even if we're seasoned Christians and have been for many, many years, there may be some little corner of our heart that we've not surrendered yet to Jesus. Maybe there's something that we're putting in front of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm asking, and I'm sure you want to ask Jesus anew and afresh every day to come into our heart, dwell in us, create within us <clears throat> a new heart. Amen. I think as we look at leadership, each one of us has influence, whether you're a pastor or a teacher, whether it's in the workplace or in the home as a mom and dad. Mm -hmm. We all are in a position of influence over others, and the key is to become a servant leader. I just want to leave, leave you with one of my favorite messianic promises from Isaiah 42, 16. He says, I will heal the lead the blind by ways they've not known along unfamiliar paths. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do for them. I will not forsake them. The son of David, Jesus Christ, here's your plea. He will give you spiritual eyesight. Amen and amen. What a blessing the study has been for this week. Each person delivering something powerful and beautiful from the Word of God. Next week, we have lesson number nine, and it's entitled Jerusalem Controversy. So we're going to continue our study in the Gospel of Mark, and we hope that you're going to continue to join us and be richly blessed. See you soon.